um, kick things off here. Uh, short agenda here, and then we're just going to get the remainder of the video started off for you guys. Um, here with the Multifamily Investment Advisors, as you guys know, every Monday at 12 p.m., we're giving you a multifamily market update here at Keller Williams, uh, the number one real estate firm in the United States with $407 billion in closed transactions throughout 2020. And obviously we're on a higher a trajectory to close out this year. Can't wait to be delivering you guys that final number uh, coming along next month here. Um, and that was $1.2 million more than the closest uh, real estate firm behind us. Um, 149 market centers in the Midwest, 26 actually in the Chicago land area, and 1,000 plus market centers in the United States. At this point in time, we definitely do have the most wide reaching network to help out our owners and investors that work with us on a daily, weekly, monthly, and annual basis. I'm gonna actually pass the microphone over to my colleague, Kelly Rich, to tell you guys about some opportunities we currently have available for our investors. I'm very happy to do that. Kelly, uh, do we have you here? Okay, hi Vince, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about two opportunities that we have currently. Um, I'm gonna highlight two of them. First, I'm gonna talk about a 55 unit portfolio that we have near the upcoming uh, Auburn Park Station. It's a mixed use portfolio um, consisting of residential and office slash retail tenants, totaling 55 units within three contiguous buildings. The retail office tenants are both internet and COVID proof. Um, it's a fully, fully occupied building under long-term ownership. Um, units are very well maintained, and the asset presents a light value add opportunity. This is being offered at three million one hundred and fifty thousand. Calling for all offers on this portfolio by next Monday, December thirteenth. So definitely reach out to us if you have interest in that portfolio. Um, all offers in by next Monday. Um, another opportunity that we have um, an opportunity to pick up in the Chicago Lawn and Gage Park neighborhoods. This 38 unit multifamily and mixed use portfolio, just minutes from Chicago's Midway Airport. Uh, this presents an opportunity to achieve returns from day one, in addition to a value add opportunity. This is being offered at an 8.22% uh, cap rate and a 14.28% cash on cash return. Um, it's being offered at $2,750,000. So definitely reach us um, if you have interest in those two portfolios. And also reach out to us um, so we can pair you up with the, the right uh, offering for your needs. We do have other uh, offerings available. I'm going to post all of our contact information in the chat. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Kelly. Definitely happy to hear about those opportunities. Excited to have some of our would-be investors get involved. We do want to wish everyone Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays here in this holiday season. And we're going to get that second half of this Chicago Association of Realtors impact of the county tax assessment webinar aired for you guys right now. I'm going to get the screen share going. And uh, as you guys know, if it is Monday at 12 p.m., you can catch the Multifamily Investment Advisors at Keller Williams Commercial here on Multifamily Monday, giving you our multifamily market update. Thank you.
from an investor point of view, that is easier to work with. On the other hand, it can create an incentive for assessments to be higher uh, because then local property tax revenues grow if assessments are higher. Here in Illinois, we, we do it the other way around. So uh, first of all, you know, the amount of taxes that are collected is determined by taxing bodies, the city, the school districts, um, and that's a lump sum of dollars that are collected every year that grow a little bit every year that assessments have absolutely no influence for. No matter how assessments go, that amount of dollars is fixed and it grows over time. So what assessments are is how we're divvying up that, that amount that's already to be collected. And so from Tony, from that investor who's paying 1.3 million, they need to think about a couple of things. They need to think about well, what's the outlook for levies in the place that I'm investing in? And that doesn't have anything to do with assessments. Um, and then they have to think about how we'll be assessing it, which is what Marty was saying. And he talked about how we have a duty to be uniform, to use the evidence to, uni to assess all folks in that situation in the same way, um, based on the market value, based on where the market is with the best data that we have. But then the other piece of the picture that they have to keep in mind is how is the total assessed value base changing in the place where I'm investing because that determines your share of the levy. Um, so um, for that investor who's looking at Chicago, if they're paying, you know, 30% more than where the, it, would, it had been established before, even if our assessment goes up to roughly that level in line with the market, if other things are going up 30% in Chicago, that would mean the change in tax is much lower and it could actually fall. Like in the suburbs, we saw a whole bunch of situations the last two years where assessments rose, but bills fell because the base grew more than the assessment that you're looking at. So I wish it was a real simple picture. It's not, this is the landscape that we're given by our historical traditions and laws in Illinois, um, but that's, that is the way it works. So that's, how, and we have a tool that everyone can see. We have a market analyst day every year where we have a, a rate simulator tool where you can put in your assumptions about how your property will be assessed, what the outlook for levies is in the place that you're in, investing in, and um, how the base might change. And you can, uh, you can adjust those different assumptions to uh, come up with a simulation of what the tax bill uh, could look like. And that's that help, that can help with underwriting for people in that situation, Tony. And we encourage clients and other people who are um, giving advice on the market to, to try to use this tool. The, the ULI, the Urban Land Institute, uh, did such a study with our tool that I think has some helpful results. Awesome. Thanks for uh, uh, making it easy to step through that very complicated um, scenario. And I, I find myself fumbling and just saying, hey, look, you may have some exposure, but it's not that it's not that cut and dry. I don't think the assessor is going to knock on your door uh, the day after you close and say, hey, look, here's your, your settlement statement. You owe us. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't work like that. Uh, although, albeit in some jurisdictions, it, it almost does <laughs> mirror that. So. We don't, we try not to do that. And by the way, there's always, there's usually a lag. We're reassessing, you know, what you know, uh, every three years. So yeah. it can take several years to catch up and taxes in our arrears. So there's like a built-in lag. Yeah, yeah. So you you can build it into your pro forma as you do the things you're doing with the property. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. So uh, really appreciate you uh, sharing that, sharing that with us. And uh, I want to go back to Jerry Carlin. Uh, and now I found out about Jordan. I almost want to call you guys JK Equity Squared, right? Um, tell me a little bit about, um, a little bit more about, um, just drive, man. Um, what, what times your day start in the morning and, you know, your, your drive to, to build more, to do more, uh, even, you know, where a lot of people are pulling back, they're putting their pencils down and they're saying, Hey, this, this environment is a little uncertain. What give us, give us some of that vision. Again, you are muted, Jerry. Well, the day looks hi. Thanks for the question. Um, our day, our day looks like a typical work day, but you know we we're in the office by you know eight eight thirty and go home by eight eight thirty. Um, 
but what drives us is, you know, I think there's always up, you know, in, in any market, there's always opportunities. And uh, we try to find those opportunities, whether they're in multi or they're in industrial or their office, there are opportunities and they're, they're not, uh, we see a lot of, we see a lot of transactions. We see a lot of deals and we got to sift through them. And then we sift through a thousand of them and maybe we can find two or three that make sense to us. Um, but uh, that's what we do. I mean, we are, um, uh, like I said, in, in any market, there's there are opportunity, whether it's, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, the COVID opportunity, which is the industrial opportunity or, uh, or are there multifamily? I mean, when we, when COVID started, multifamily was a horrible place to invest. And as COVID progressed, it became the, one of the favorite trials of, uh, of the real estate industry. And I mean, you find, you're, we're finding cap rates around the country in areas that you would never believe would you would even want to invest in at three and a half to 4% cap rates, which is amazing to, for us. I mean, you, that was, those were the cap rates in New York City. Now, of course, the cap rates in New York City are a lot different because of COVID and vacancy rates, et cetera. But, um, so, you know, we, we're tr we try to balance uh, what we do and try to find the opportunities where they may be, whether it's in Baltimore or Virginia or uh, Milwaukee. Or the, the, it doesn't really, to us, um, you know, we have a, we have a geograph geographic uh, limitations, but uh, we search for those opportunities. And it, like I said, in any market, there are opportunities. Any, whether it's a bad market or a great market, there are always opportunities and we try to find them they're, and they're hard to find, but that's what we do every day, look for those opportunities as well as managing the day, the day to day operations and the uh, our contractors and subcontractors, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a full day every day. Like I said before, you know, we could work 24 seven, um, but you know, there is a life after business. So we try to try to balance our personal lives with our business lives. And what drives us is the ability to just generate revenues and you know we have a lifestyle and we have big families and we like to keep them you know uh, in, in in good shape and that's what we do and uh, we have a lot of obligations you know as developers we take a lot of risk um, yeah. and uh, it's the, the risk is uh, bigger than you know putting in twenty five dollars down on a blackjack table so uh, we have to manage that risk and the, one of the biggest jobs that we have is managing risk and, uh, uh, so we have a full day and we, uh, and what drives us is just finding more business and finding more opportunities. Awesome. Another uh, great question coming in for the assessor's office. The office uh, made a adjustment for 2020, the COVID adjustment uh, for homeowners. And um, uh, at the same time, we're seeing uh, home prices um, tick up and up and up. Um, however, we are seeing a little bit of a pullback now, a little bit of a slowdown. But tell us, um, in, in hindsight, would you do things differently? Or how, how do you feel about the, the COVID adjustment and where we are today? Hey, Tony. Well, great question. And, and I wanted to uh, sort of let's relook at the premise of the question there. Because remember that um, we the COVID adjustment took into account what was going on with commercial and residential. And actually, it was a choice. You know, when when uh, when COVID hit March of 2020, uh, we were we were just starting to send out assessments for the south and west suburbs, communities where businesses have been living on the precipice of you know, success and going out of business. You know, even before COVID, um, and we saw the data coming in from COVID, we could look at the capital markets. The good thing about the capital markets is that every day you have focused portfolios of properties within different commercial real estate niches where the market is making a judgment every day on how much values are changing because of changes in conditions. And we could see that hotels, uh, strip retail, mall retail, um, other classes, we're down huge um, in 2020. Um, and what good does it send, would it do to send out 
commercial assessments to those commercial property owners in the south and western suburbs that have already been on the precipice of of uh, not being able to stay in business in many cases to send assessments that are way off 20 30 40 percent off because the market had moved down so much um, and they would have recourse through the appeals process uh, to take into account the COVID conditions, but it would be at big cost to them. And there are not all commercial properties appeal, especially the smallest ones, especially the mom and pops. You know, we're, we're charged with uh, being the best reflector of the market that we can to be the, the one uh, part of the assessment system that focuses on equity. The best thing to do is not to send assessments that are way out of date. We're going to incur big costs to people that wouldn't serve any good, that would worsen inequity, instead to take those conditions to account when we did it. But if we did that, we also had to take our best guess of what the impact on residential was. And we did have capital market indicators too on residential, but we had to make a call by April of 2020. We could not wait for the whole year to develop because the tax process has to go on. Everyone gets a right to appeal at our office. They got a right to appeal at another venue. Um, and so we had to make that valuation call by April of 2020. So that's where it was. And let's remember that residential values really took off in the second half of 2020. And it never would have been in the cards for us to, to, do, uh, to wait until then to, to do that. So that's, that's why there's, there's no regrets. We think the fact that COVID has stayed around so long just reinforces you know, our, our belief in that that was a good thing for, for everyone to have done in a very difficult time well, we had to make a call with limited information. Awesome. Um, yeah, I, I believe that, yeah, you couldn't predict that. Um, I think that the, the COVID, there was a COVID adjustment that happened naturally um, with the shelter in place and, 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 and people having to kind of limit where they're going and what they're doing uh, that um, uh, had an intrinsic value, uh, if you will, on the land. That, that, that little patch of dirt in your backyard became much more sacred, right? There's, there's a lot more um, backyard uh, fire pits being sold and uh, people spend a lot more time in the garden and things like that. Um, and I know I, I'm, I'm one of them. Um, uh, yeah. Really, yeah. And, and Tony, I just want to add two more things there. First of all, we're reassessing Chicago this year. Now we have that fuller picture of... <laughs> What happened in 2020 and you know as homeowners would tell you that okay my assessment now is increased uh uh in many places because of you know what happened in the second half of 2020 so we're we're just trying to be that mirror to the market with the information that we have so uh, we think you know um it's not fun to send out assessments that are rising uh for for homeowners but um, we we followed the market this year people can see that and it's generally following a trend in the past that residential is growing. Um, um, commercial on balance is growing a little bit more because of past undervaluation. Some classes still doing well. The other, if everyone wants to read anything more, uh, we have on our website um, slides from a presentation that I gave to the city club uh, where you can see the charts and the data that we saw um, in you know, March, April, 2020. Um, it's on the medium section of our site. I think in the chat, um, Scott will post it. And then um, uh, y'all can take a look if you really want to dig in. Yeah, and Jerry and Jerry, uh, feel free to take this one. Um, I know when the COVID crisis originally started, um, a lot of the lenders kind of pulled back and put their pencils down and say, hey, we got to wait and see. Uh, last year for multifamily, I think Jerry's mentioned it a couple of times, it was a big pullback. Um, this was one of the lowest years on record as far as multifamily sales, right around uh, 2 billion for Chicagoland, uh, which is usually a 2.6, $2.9 billion uh, market as far as multifamily is concerned. Uh, have you seen uh, some of the lenders are still a little bit hesitant to come out of the gates uh, for various reasons, property taxes, un uncertainty in the market and things like that. Uh, just give us some insight on, on what you're seeing there as far as, far as the lending lending uh, environment. Well, the pattern I've noticed is having talked to local lenders, some of Weaver on this uh, Zoom, local lenders uh, are still you know, eat, doing deals here and they are lending. I think the difference you would notice compared to national lenders, I think 
there is a real pattern there of some of them backing away from uh, particularly larger deals in Chicago. And one of the concerns they raise is the uncertainty about what's going on with assessments and taxes. But, but uh, the local lenders I've talked to say, will tell me that they are doing deals. And I know other people who are confirming that, yes, they are doing things, particularly with multifamily. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Jerry. It's uh, the, small, the smaller local lenders are doing business. The larger lenders are staying away from Chicago, not only because of the, the assessment uncertainty, but also because of other a variety of other reasons, including you know the national, uh, all the news about the crime and the shootings in Chicago, and uh, the uncertainty of the, uh, the current administration. So there's a lot of reasons that they're staying away. And I don't think it's just, I don't think it just has to do with the assessment, it has to do with sort of the global picture of what's going on in, in Chicago town uh, with respect to crime and uh, the political climate. Uh, but around the country, uh, I think there's a significant amount of liquidity out there uh, and lenders are looking to place their funds into uh, especially multifamily and industrial the industrial sector, um, the um, some of the criteria and the um, leverage has come up, which is, I should say, the leverage has come up, rates are down, so uh, that's very good and um, helps us in, in making some decisions. And the um, lend the uh, banks or the lending institutions out of Europe or the investors out of Europe are coming into, into the United States in a big way, still coming, not as big as they used to, but they're still coming in because of negative yields in, in Europe, and Western Europe. So, uh, and to find, and they're chasing yield. Everybody's chasing, well, the banks are chasing yield and the investors are chasing yield. So uh, if we can get the yield up in the, uh, in the multifamily and, and in the industrial, the, the money is available. So we're finding that on a national level, um, but in Chicago, it's more, about, it's more about the local lenders. And we have some very good relationships locally and uh, we have a good track record. So that helps us in, securing our financing that we need. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. Um, seems like for every lender that kind of put his pencils down, there was a, another guy willing to, you know, kind of step in. Uh, same thing with the uh, institutional investors slowing down uh, a bit at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we had some of the guys that were uh, kind of private capital, private money that were uh, just under that institutional place space looking at it as an opportunity to get in when they've been getting beat out by these big billionaire institutions. Um, they were able to get in because, uh, you know, they were driving the cap rates down uh, and, and into a level that they couldn't couldn't compete with it uh, um, as well. So yeah, there are a number of factors that that come into play when you're when you're dealing with the national lenders. Sometimes the underwriter can see something on the news. Uh, we had a deal recently uh, I think the underwriter saw something on the news and kind of got skittish at the end of the, the deal to say, hey, this this T12, this water bill spiked in this month and that this month, and we're concerned where we may not want to do this deal. And I'm looking at the debt coverage ratios and they were pretty good. And like, there has to be something else here. Uh, obviously, they were sheltering in place that month. People were home more. So they're, they're going to flush the toilet more. So <laughs> the, the bill's going to rise. Um, but uh, we're able to get through it uh, with, the, with a few conversations and keep things moving. Uh, we're at the 11.50. We're gonna have what's uh, very exciting. Uh, I wanna call it a lightning round. Uh, we're gonna start with Ma Marty Paulson. Uh, will you just give us two minutes? Uh, tell, us, tell, us, tell us what's out there. Uh, give, give us some feedback and um, just, just, it's your show, it's your microphone, go for it. Well, I think the one thing that you did ask about is kind of want to understand the timing on some of the future assessments. So we're trying to finish up uh, South Chicago uh, between today and this weekend. So we hope that those no assessment notices will go out uh, a couple of weeks from that, that date. Um, the next town up uh, will be uh, Lake Township, then Lakeview and Hyde Park will be the last one. Uh, Lake and Hyde Park are obviously very large townships uh, for us, and, and it takes us uh, quite a bit of time to, to do some QC on that 
uh, on those valuations when there are 150,000 residential parcels, for example, in those. So, uh, you know, we hope to uh, be able to uh, try to get that all that activity done by the end of October. I don't know, that might be a little bit ambitious, but uh, uh, certainly would like to, and we'll do our best to do that. And uh, again, I know we have uh, people who are, you have your, your finger on the pulse of a wide variety of different markets. And you not only have a finger on the pulse, but you are the market makers um, in some of the communities where we are still going to be doing assessing. So I just wanna make a pitch for a couple of things. First, if you have commercial property owners um, in Lake Township, Lake View, um, or Hyde Park Township. So that's basically Chicago, south of Pershing, um, plus Lakeview Township. Have them file an RPI form, the Real Property Income and Expense form, because that gives us additional information beyond the broad brush commercial data that we can get from things like CoStar, which are not necessarily very reliable, especially in a lot of the neighborhoods of Chicago. That gives us a broad brush insight into what's going on. You know, I was talking with someone who owns a strip mall in South Shore, and she was saying, you know, here's the issues that we've had with COVID. Non-payment of rent, whatever space I've got open, leasing out is hard. So the expected rent I can get is lower. I have to put, make, give them more concessions. I am, I have to pay more for security um, and for other COVID. And these are all things that detract from NOI. For goodness sakes, when we find that out, when we have documentation of it, it lowers people's uh, it can lo generally a lower the assessment will put on a lower the cost and make makes the hassle easier. Well, you have to fill out the RPI form when you appeal anyway. I just encourage you all for your clients to have them fill out that RPI form and submit for us because it the people who've done it um, have have uh, it's really helped them. Like and this includes some of the biggest buildings on the Mag Mile when they were able to get that information to us. It ended up lowering the assessment that we started with because we got more information about. It hey, here's what's going on with what we can really lease this is out of. Here's the, here's the change in our costs. And, and so if it makes a big difference for, for someone who's big, it makes even more of a difference for someone who is small, whose experience that they're having is probably very different from the data that's published in CoStar and these other third-party sources. So that's one pitch I wanted to make to you and the people that you work, work with second. Um, work with us just so we we like to use the rpi to get a sense but we also like to talk to market makers to get a sense of to do a sanity test on the data that we're getting so we can call around and ask hey you know our model you know what are you seeing in terms of lease rates on this corridor we have this property classified as a class c is it um those are the kinds of things that talking to market makers like you really helps us and really will help um, get things situated when we are sending out those assessments. So we really need to be doing this like in the next month and a half. So if you can do it, we'd love that. Awesome, yeah, our office is really willing to share information. I believe that um, coming from a sense of knowing uh, is better. The, the big bad wolf is always better when you don't know, uh, is always worse when you, what the unknown is always worse than the known. So. We'll definitely share information. Um, we have reached out to the office uh, on a couple of times and, and we'll continue to do so uh, to keep the information flowing, flowing uh, freely. Uh, uh, Jerry Brown, any closing thoughts? Um, uh, uh, actually, I have, a, here? Uh, I have a question for the assessor prompted by some of his earlier comments about COVID and vacancy. I, one of the big questions, and I guess we're gonna see that with some of the data released today at North is uh, the ongoing impact of COVID and vacancy in downtown office buildings. I know you, your office has had a policy of kind of restricting the ability to get vacancy year after year. I think you have a two-year limitation on it, but one, are you viewing COVID as a continuing impact that would justify the recognition of a level of a vacancy that you might not have considered otherwise? So I'm going to respond briefly, and then Marty, you can build on this, because Marty, you are where the rubber hits the road. Um, just to be clear, we're not limiting, taking into account vacancy. What we are 
doing is we're look, we are looking at the vacancy rate on a corridor or for an asset class. And we're saying that any reasonable buyer of an asset in that area would have to would be looking at that vacancy rate and making their own financial projections, whether the place was fully leased or totally empty. Um, and so we give the credit for that that prevailing vacancy rate to every commercial property, whether it's occupied or not. Um, because a reasonable buyer, if they're buying it today and trying to lease it up, would have would encounter those conditions that best replicates the market. That's the best market practice. When we talk to our peers around the country, Marty can build on that. Uh, what we, if you are, if a property is claiming additional vacancy on top of what we're what we're seeing in terms of uh, uh, the prevailing vacancy, then we give partial temporary credit for that additional amount of vacancy. Because as all of you know, um, as market makers, if you have a hotel that's completely vacant because of COVID, a buyer is not gonna mark, that, that hotel still has value, right? And it's not just like 10% of where it was. Um, if you look at you know what if someone's paying in terms of dollars per key, it might be down 50% or 40%, but it's not gonna be down 90%. Or 100%. It's not a zero, and so that partial temporary credit reflects um, that circumstance. Now, Marty, do you want to build on that? I know there are other caveats yeah. to make there. If something's still building up and it's not ready for occupancy yet, if there are other issues with, is it even occupiable? Uh, you want to build on that, Marty? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I think a couple things with respect to vacancy. We 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 had a great call a couple of weeks ago, right before we finished our north uh, uh, north valuations. And, and a, a market maker gave us some great insights. And we had, we had done, uh, we had had a lot of consideration of how we were gonna treat vacancy. And, and that individual gave us a whole lot more uh, in terms of the things that we should look for in the marketplace. And we appreciated that opportunity and we made some significant adjustments again. So we think we've made some appropriate adjustments to our models uh, based on both what we think has occurred. I, there are certainly gonna be things that we do not know. And that's where you know, our appeal process is a, is a good opportunity. Um, uh, I, I will admit it, our vacancy policy is not the same as it was in, in prior years. It, you know, that, that is a, that to Chris's point, that was a policy that just did not take any accounting for what the value of the property really is. It just made a, a blunt reduction um, that fair, fair, frankly was not fair to other taxpayers uh, who, who were paying full boat. Um, so we think our adjustment in that regard is the right thing to do without a doubt um, and took away some of the criticism of vacancy in the past. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing is, is I, I can't say that we know everything because we don't. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the office, I'm walking the streets, I, I, you know, I, there are things going on that probably we're not aware of. And, and hopefully, if we get the information that, that, that we need to, uh, and can consume that, and make an appropriate other adjustment, we're, we're open to doing that. Thank you very much uh, to our panelists. Uh, and. Uh, for participating in today's uh, commercial forum. Um, thank all of the committee members and the uh, participants for showing up. Uh, just a couple announcements. Uh, Jacob, uh, I don't know, can you tell them about uh, some of the things that commercial forum is working on in its last minute? Um, we got a couple of mural dedications coming up this weekend. And, um, and then we'll give, give you guys your afternoon at back and enjoy your weekend. Thanks, Tony. I didn't uh... I didn't know I would be on camera today, so uh, here I am. But yeah, we got a couple of things happening to look for from Commercial Forum. Tomorrow at Ma Houston Pocket Park on South 51st, we're part of a mural project that's been done down there. The muralist Ramon Static, whose work is all over Chicago and always beautiful, has painted a mural of some community activists, and the Chicago Association of Realtors and Commercial Forum helped fund that. Dedication ceremony from about 11 to 4, and around 1 o'clock, they're doing some speeches and honoring some community members with plaques. And so I encourage you to come out to that. Tony will be standing up and talking a little bit. Should be a good time. 
Uh, next week on Thursday in the Andersonville neighborhood, we have another mural commemoration. It's a, that time of year for us, it seems. Uh, we did this one in, in um, collaboration with the Andersonville Chamber of Commerce. It is uh, done by a local muralist named Molly Costello. Her work is also really beautiful and you can see it around Chicago too. This one is uh, dedicated to Andersonville as a safe haven community and notions of home and, uh, and uh, protest. And so I'd encourage you to come out to that. It's Thursday from 9.30 in the morning until 10.30. And so if you want to show up a little early and have some coffee and chat, then we'll get going around 9.30. Uh, we also have a new product coming uh, next year. So look for it. It's called Legal Library. We haven't begun to promote it yet, but we're very close to being ready. Uh, and that will be something that we think will be really helpful to members who are looking to save some money on legal expense and have a little more flexibility around how they handle forms and contracts. So look for more on that. And otherwise, yeah, like Tony said, thanks to everybody for coming. Um, I'm sure Assessor Kagey is getting tired of us by now. He's, he's spoken to our group quite a few times, so we always are happy to have him. And, uh, and you know, it's great to hear what's happening, and everyone's looking forward to seeing the numbers that come out later today. So I guess we'll drop that on a Friday afternoon. I hope that does not portend negatively. Uh, so uh, otherwise, uh, thanks again from Commercial Forum, and you all have a great weekend. Thanks. And uh, just to be clear, uh, I enjoy you. I, the energy I always builds by the end of the call versus the beginning of the call. I'm, we're always happy to connect with you. So connect with us on social media. Connect with us and me on social media on LinkedIn. Always happy to talk. My email is fritz at cookcountyassessor.com.